Yeah, I have the same accent in French, actually. <laughs> um, so um, today I'm going to talk about human-centered design because this is what I'm, I've been doing for 30 years. We didn't call it this way before, but uh, you know, um, people refer to user-centered design, but I don't like this term, actually. We are not users, we are people, actually. And uh, why do, 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 do we use this terminology, user-centered design? It is because first we design a machine, and then we realize that there are people who will be using this machine. And guess what we do? So we design a user interface in between. And uh, so in fact, sometimes we oppose the, the world of engineering to the world of human factors. I put many colors in the human factors because there are many disciplines, psychology, physiology, sociology, etc., And ergonomics. I would like to demonstrate to you that this approach is wrong. And uh, why? We talked about purpose uh, all along this uh, uh, today. Um, and then here, you can see that we go from means to purpose, instead of going from purpose to means. Maybe it's due to the fact that during the 20th century we were designing a lot of technology. Today we have more technology than we can uh, afford to use. So in fact, we can use the technology to satisfy purposes. Then, what I call human-centered design is actually this uh, uh, triptych, technology, organization, and people. So I, I use this... Uh, T-O-P, top model, uh, when I give my classes at FIT. And um, let's start with technology. So this is um, uh, a meeting that we had uh, a few years ago when we were designing a lunar rover, lunar electric rover, in fact, um, together with um, many people, including astronauts, uh, aerospace engineers, psychologists and artists, cartoonists, who were actually following what we were saying about scenarios. In fact, scenarios are extremely important to design, to actually express the purpose of what we want to do. And then you design all kinds of things after the scenarios. Simulation, a simulation could be set up with paper and pencil. It could be uh, also implemented with very sophisticated simulator today. So we call this participatory design. This is, um, this, these are pictures I took at Johnson Space Center. It's not far from here. Um, this, this was the rover built, in, uh, and these picture, pictures were taken in February 2009. In fact, I noticed uh, during that, this test here that um, the astronaut inside the, the, the rover uh, was always asking, could I go right, could I go uh, left, forward, backward? And uh, you know, all this is very important. Observation, when you simulate something, because this is not yet on the moon, but I say to myself, but when this guy will be on the moon, there will be nobody outside. You know, look at this. You know, when you want to park your car, maybe there's someone outside telling you, yeah, you should go a little bit more left. So in fact, we, uh, we started to define all kinds of purposes, and in, in this case, navigation systems. So in fact, we got this idea of uh, designing what we call a virtual camera. A virtual camera is a... Uh, um, uh, a piece of software, like uh, Google Earth or Google Moon, in, uh, uh, that you can use actually to navigate. You know, so you, you can use a, a joystick like this this guy here, and uh, you have the you have the screen. Let me check if it works. You have a screen here and a joystick here, and then uh, the virtual you can move the virtual camera all around from bottom, top, right you know, uh, left, etc., and you can show, you know, where you are. 
So you're going to tell me, yes, but this depends on the, uh, the, uh, the data that you have. And this is precisely what, what we, we are working on right now. In fact, uh, we, um, we are working also on a mechanism to uh, fuse external cameras that could be uh, uh, put on robots outside uh, or on the, on the rover itself and augmenting incrementally the precision of the, uh, of the database. So we, we worked on this, but we work also on the, on the way to display and, and to use, to manipulate this data. So one of the... Um, what we have here is the virtual camera. This is a tablet-based application. Designed this is a tablet-based application. Other planetary bodies, such as the so you can look Mars. like this, like this, like this, you know, and it's very easy to use. So there is no problem with the technology. We have the technology. We have now to augment this technology. While they're on the surface, this is actually uh, used um, on the data uh, of the deserts the, that is implemented in the, in the Arizona desert, where we tested the, the rover. And um, uh, so you can augment incrementally I mean, the precision of, the, of the, uh, the database here by putting some uh, icons. Let's say, well, this is dangerous, this is very interesting for scientific uh, uh, exploration. The more we, we use this, uh, this uh, tool, the more we thought about, you know, but uh, that would be very interesting for geologists. And then uh, uh, the geologists are on the ground most of the time. And uh, so we have massive amount of data coming from space, and now with curiosity, we can have more on Mars. So in fact, uh, we use the same concept, but uh, at this time, not on a tablet, but on a big wall, on a big screen. So this is a prototype here, where you can actually use the data and use your hands. Like uh, when I speak, you know, maybe because I'm, I come from the south of France, so I use my hands to explain. Uh, but uh, um, we use also the voice. So in fact, it's interesting to use the, the multi-touch uh, uh, aspect, but also the voice. So in fact, the interaction with the data is not only with touch, but also with voice. So in fact, we can name this... Um, uh, this zone here. Oh, there is no, no sound. So in fact, he's going to say uh, color green. So you, and you can recall this zone. You can, so you can work with the data in a very natural fashion. So we are not talking about putting uh, an interface like in the past, but we are working on the system itself. So um, I said human-centered design is a matter of technology, organization, and people. Let's talk about organization. I've been working in space, but also in aviation. And this is a project that I conducted in, in Europe um, a few years ago. And these two screens, you know, this screen here is uh, uh, on that side here, is the screen of an air traffic controller. This screen is a screen of a, of a, a, a pilot. And these two screens express exactly the same situation, but they are different, right? It's exactly the same as this. You know, the people are playing the same symphony, but they have different scores, and they have to, uh, to do that in a symbiotic fashion. So in fact, today, we are getting more and more into this framework where uh, we have to coordinate people, where we have to design scores. And uh, in fact, in the past, the controller was saying, I mean, or now actually, the controller was saying, or is saying to the, to the pilot, take flight level 320, for instance, and the pilot said, okay, boss. In the, in the future, with the, uh, the, the amount of uh, airplanes in the sky, we will have to do uh, different things. And this is what the Next Gen program, the CESAR program in Europe, are uh, investigating right now. So in fact, we are more in this kind of model the, that I call the orchestra model, where uh, everybody should share a music theory, I mean, a common frame of reference. The scores should be set up by composers 
And uh, we lack all, uh, you know, composers today, so we have to train these people. And conductors, the conductor is someone who, who gives the tempo uh, during performance. And also the musicians. The musicians are different from the soldiers of the past. I mean, the musicians need not, not only uh, to perform on their instrument, on the violin, like uh, uh, what we saw before and what we heard before, but also hear the other people and uh, actually coordinate as well. And also the audience, who <coughs> is actually the, the, um, the, use, the customers. Uh, in this case, I mean aviation, I mean everybody, I mean the, 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 the passengers. So in fact, this uh, orchestra model is very interesting to study for uh, design of complex systems. What about people? People, I like this uh, 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 citation from Umberto Eco, an Italian writer and, and philosopher. There is no difference between the cold speculative intelligence and artist intuition. There is something artistic and scientific uh, discovery and something scientific in what naive people call artist genius intuition. What they have in common is the happiness of abduction. So I'm not talking about abducting kids there. I mean, I'm talking about the abduct abductive reasoning. You know, there are three logical inferences, lo uh, deduction, induction, and abduction. Abduction is actually projecting yourself in the future and demonstrating that your solution will actually uh, get to the point. And this is uh, very important, actually, to, uh, to use today in, in the complex society where we are. Especially, the complexity is coming mainly from the, inter, the interconnection that we uh, multiply every day. So, in fact, I designed a PhD program at FIT uh, that actually teaches uh, what I'm talking about here, but except that all these modules are 45 hours each, and we try to, to convey to the, to the students, you know, this complexity analysis, this uh, advanced interaction media in the way that I described in the, in the, in the virtual camera and more, um, the modeling and simulation. I mean, human factors could be studied very early during the design process by modeling and simulation. We can simulate a full airplane today uh, only on software and test it. So organization design and management, this is extremely important. We don't, you know, design has lots of repercussions on organization and the way the organization is set up has a lot of repercussions on the type of technology that you choose. And life critical system, I have no time to discuss this, but if you are interested, I mean, um, there is a new book coming. So the meaning is really the key. Uh, people need more meaning today, okay? We, are, we have lots of technology, that's not the problem. The meaning is key and creativity is uh, associated to that. So in fact, um, uh, many people today talked about science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And this is a problem today because in um, occidental countries, I mean, uh, young people are kind of reluctant to go to STEM education. But if we add this creativity and this meaning by the way of introducing art at the same time, going from STEM to STEAM, uh, I strongly believe that uh, we can reach the point. We need also motivation and enthusiasm. I want to, to show you what my students, my International Space University students did last month. They actually did this movie Did you know that most astronauts flying into space today to discover the mysteries of the universe have become astronauts at the age of five? When they were kids, they saw on TV the first rocket launches, the first man in space, the first man to walk on the moon, and they decided then and there to become astronauts when they grew up. They were young, but so big was their desire, their passion, their determination to fly into space. For over 30 years, they worked on their goal, day and night, until one day, that dream became true. That dream became reality. They conquered all possible challenges, fears and doubts. They flew into space and now, they are your dream and your children's dream.
These people are the hard evidence that you can do it too. If they did it, you can do it. Decide now to follow your goal. Put all your heart, your energy, your time and effort and very soon the skies, the galaxies, the universe will open for you. Now it is your turn. Decide now. Follow your heart, your enthusiasm and make your dream come true. Study science, mathematics, engineering and technology and fly into space. And as John Lennon said, some may say you're a dreamer, but you're not the only one. So jump and grow your wings on the way up. The 20th century was a century of René Descartes. René Descartes was, uh, you know, um, the revelation, I mean, the 20th century was the revelation of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We built cars, we built uh, um, uh, uh, airplanes, uh, space shuttle, I mean, nuclear power plants. Um, what will be the, 20th, the 21st century? The 21st century, I strongly believe that it will be the century of Leonardo da Vinci. What is really interesting is that it's a kind of back to the future, because Leonardo da Vinci lived one century before uh, uh, René Descartes. Thank you very much.